surface landmarks of the abdomen. Here I'm going to tell you about the surface landmarks on the abdomen. Let me do the diagram first. Okay, now here you're seeing uh, the three views for your surface landmarks of the abdominal. I've drawn it. This is the anterior view. This is the posterior view, and here it is the lateral view from the left side. Okay, so let's focus upon here. Now the bony landmarks, you know, this point here, this bone here, it's a small tongue-shaped point tip process which is sometimes bifaded or sometimes having a perforation and that is the zygoid process. So important about the zygoid process, let me tell you, I am just now covering up your MCQ purpose also, so stay focused. This zygoid process lies over to this T9 volume. This is important for your cross-sectional anatomy. And if it, in case they ask the level of the sternosephisternal joint then it will be at the junction of T8 and T9. Ziphoid lies at the level of night thoracic vertebrae. Okay now here what you are seeing here now this is you know the last rib that reaches to the sternum is the seventh rib right it's a true rib so if this is seventh rib eighth rib joins its coastal cartilage with its co coastal cartilage to the seventh rib above. This is the ninth rib, and similarly, it's the tenth. So these coastal cartilages they form a coastal margin anteriorly. This coastal margin, you will find that in the mid axillary line. This is the mid axillary line. This is the mid axillary line. Right? Between. So here you see that in the mid axillary line, which is the lowest line rib, it is the tenth rib. It means if you bring out a rib cage from a skeleton and place it on a table, which rib will touch the table? Tenth rib. So after seeing here that in the mid axillary line, the lowest line rib is the 10th rib. Now some other MCQs. The longest rib, the longest rib is 7th rib. Most obliquely placed rib. Most obliquely placed rib. Remember, it is the 9th rib. This is most obliquely placed. Most obliquely placed. Seventh rib is the seventh rib is the longest rib. Seventh is the longest. Tenth, tenth, what special point? Tenth is the lowest. Lowest line lowest line rib in the mid axillary line right tell me which is the shortest rib the smallest rib smallest rib is first rib most curved rib again 
first horizontally placed first this joint is done with a piece of joint anyway so this forms the coastal margin now this coastal margin when it reaches here to this piston now it makes an angle and this angle here this angle here is called the infrasternal angle right infrasternal angle and the area of, of, of the abdominal line to this is called a big yes because and what lies deep to this is remember immediately behind to this lies not to the stomach it is the left lobe of the liver and deep to that will be the stomach okay then this you know is the pubis the pubis has this you know this point here is the pubic symphysis then you have in the pubic crest the horizontal surface superior part and then you have this nearly placed is the pubic tubercles these are elevated points on the upper part of the pubis and these points are you know these are anterior superior pubic spines these are anterior superior pubic spine this is the anterior end of the pubic so from anterior superior spine up to pubic tubercle you know, there is this ligament called the inguinal ligament right it is you know it is modification of the epineurus of the external oblique so this is normal reaches to this and this has a convexity downwards this has a convexity downwards because the pull by the fascia lat that is a thick in fascia here in the front of the thigh so this you see is the boundary and what are these these are the flanks these are called the flanks in right So the extent of flank is between the tenth rib and the iliac crest, literally. Then, in the midline, right from the pubic sternum, passing through the umbilicus, reaching to this pubic symphysis, there is a median line, which is a vascular, not of the skin, of course, deep inside. the muscles three muscles of the anterior lateral abdominal wall and two lateral abdominal wall you know external oblique abdominis and the oblique abdominis transverse abdominis they have this aponeurotic expansion anteriorly and they cover this muscle in the middle line that is rectus sheath abdominis by their aponeurotic expansion to form a rectus sheath so that rectus sheath abdominis of course is a paired muscle so that the rectus sheath blends and decussates in the middle line And B, you know, being a fibrous tissue, is an avascular, and it is a white tissue. So that's why you call this as linea albicans or linea alba. This is linea alba. Right? Okay. And as I was telling, there was this paired muscle rectus abdominis on both sides. So the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis, which is enclosed within this rectus sheath, there also is an oblique line, and that oblique line is somewhat semilunar, right? Because of the contour of the rectus abdominis. So that's why this line here is called linea semilunaris. This is linea semilunaris. The lateral margin of the rectus abdominis or the lateral of the rectus sheath. Linea semilunaris. And remember, the linea semilunaris extends from the pubic tubercle up to this point, that is the tip of the ninth postal cartilage. I'll tell you there are a lot of many points relevant to this tip of the ninth postal cartilage. One line, if I ask you, one line which overrides to this linea semilunaris is 
that is coming from the thoracic region. What is that line which overrides this linear cellular house? And that is milk line of shells. Remember this. The milk line of shells is a continuation of the anterior axillary fold to the anterior axillary line passing from the nipples then to the tip of the ninth coastal cartilage and reaches down to the pubic tip. Got it? So in the lower portion, linear similarities is the same as the milk line. And milk line of shells is that line on which you find a supernumerary nipples, especially in the quadrupeds. Okay, so that was the lateral view. Now we'll be talking about the surface landmarks on the back. So in the back, of course, you will find the midline is the spinous process of the thoracic, lumbar and sacral spines. Because the coastal margin posteriorly is the last thread that is the 12th rib you find. So you can confirm that this one is T12. So on the back, when you see this T12, you can palpate down the spine. Then you will reach to this eyelid crest posteriorly. This is the eyelid crest which you palpate easily on the back. Right? But in the median plane, posteriorly you will find thick rigid muscles which are very strong muscles. Superficially placed is the you know that. But deep down is the deep muscles which includes erector spine. And if you still go anteriorly, you find swast major, which is facing towards the peritoneal cavity. Right? So from behind, you find is erectus spine. So erectus spine will be like, you know, right? you know, this, this you presume to be the spine. Let's say this is the spine. Right? So this angle here, this angle here, what is this angle called? Remember that this angle here is called costo vertebral angle. This is the costo vertebral angle between the 12th rib and the lumbar spine. But you know that there is this muscle line between the transverse processes you know these vertebrae they do have their transverse processes so in between these transverse processes you find posteriorly placed is a muscle and that muscle is called erector spiny right so this is erector spiny the angle formed here this angle this angle is between the lateral border of erector spiny and the 12th rib. This is called the renal angle in the surface. Why is this renal angle called? Of course, you should know that there are kidneys, the lower poles of the kidneys placed here. And you also should know that the right kidney is a little bit lower placed kidney. So because you find the lower poles in this region, you call this as venal line. So the difference is costovertebral is between the spine and the 12th rib, renal line is between the lateral border of rectus spiny and the 12th rib. Then, when you go down D, you know, I have already uploaded a lecture on palpating for this lumbar puncture. You know, you need to palpate these eyelid crest. When you palpate it, you place your little finger over the eyelid crest with the, you know, thumb. You can palpate here, the spine. So, what spine lies at the level of the highest point of eyelid crest is, actually, it is fourth lumbar spine. Fourth lumbar, what you mean? Right? So if this is fourth and this is the third lumbar spine, right? So with that, here you will find is the intervertebral disc between the third and the fourth. And 
you know, you just have to palpate for this and then palpate for the third spine with your thumb and in between ask the subject to bend more forward, then you can reach up to this space between third and fourth vertebra. What you get? Spines. And one more important point about the surface landmarks is these dimples here. These are also called gluteal dimples or sacral dimples. These are called gluteal dimples, sacral or sacral dimples. These dimples are actually a surface landmark for underlying a bony prominence and that is the posterior, you know, this is spine, iliac spine, iliac crest, it reaches down like this, like this. So this point here is posterior superior iliac spine, okay? And this point provides origin to few fibers of the largest muscle of the human body. So which, what muscle is the largest muscle of the human body? Gluteus maximus. If it's asked which is the very powerful muscle of the human body, then ask gluteus maximus. But alone, not alone. There are few muscles which are said to be powerful, most powerful muscles. One of them is gluteus maximus, masseter, erector spine. There's a few muscles which are very powerful. And again, it also, gluteus maximus is a very strong anti-gravity muscle which helps you stand up from a squatting position. So remember that from posterior superior spine, there is gluteus maximus that arises. And this point on the surface is represented like a dumbbells. And if you draw a transverse plane passing the two dimples, you will find that it crosses through this spine and that is S2 spine. It crosses through the second sacral spinous process. And these are around 4 to 5 centimeter away, laterally placed from the midline. Laterally placed from the midline. Got it? Then the fold here in between, the gluteal region, this fold is called the natal cleft. Natal cleft. In the natal cleft also, you can palpate S3 also. Right? The further signal and reaching down below, if you keep palpating the natal cleft, you can reach down to palpate the cossacks also, which lies a little behind to the inner opening. I hope you understood about the surface landmarks on the back and now tell me which region is this? What region is this? What region is this? This is called loins. Right? So loins is the portion of the abdominal wall behind between the ribs and the eyelids. On the lateral side, the between the 10th rib, remember, there it was with the 12th, between 12th rib and eyelid crest is loins. In the mid axillary line, on the later rib, between the 10th rib, because the lowest line, in 10th and the eyelid crest, this is called flags. Got it? Okay. So you've seen that anteriorly in the median plane, the extent of abdomen is the highest. The most widest extent of the is anteriorly. And the midpoint of this line, the linea alba between xiphoid process and pubic biceps, is somewhere above the umbilicus. So, umbilicus lies a little below to the midline of the abdomen. And umbilicus, I will tell you in detail, it lies at the transverse level of T3 and T4. So in the later view, here also you can see that this much is the flax, right? And here, this much is the loins. This is the loins. 
but this much is the anterior extent of the abdominal wall. Much wide extent anterior. And umbilicus lies a little below the midpoint. Okay, so that was enough today.